Good day. Today's topic, pirate gardening, what I've had encountered and what I think is going to be uh, the best selection for this. And if I could get to it, what I know about chickens, I dealt with uh, the Rhode Island Reds. All right, the drawbacks. Obviously, uh, it's going to be a little ways out, so you might not be able to water it on a regular basis. And the other thing I had encountered was because the, the soil hadn't really been cultivated and uh, amended, that uh, I had a lot more pest problems. And so unless you get a, a place with uh, a good annual rainfall, you are going to uh, have the problems with watering. All right, the um, cayenne pepper that I grew, uh, although the peppers were a lot smaller, the plants stayed very healthy and were heavy producers, but the peppers, instead of being, you know, three, three and a half inches, they were more like two, two and a half, no big deal, uh, especially because it's not really a food, it's more of a condiment. Uh, cress is a low-lying, spicy green, and I love this because it's a perennial and it will self-sow, and it looks like a weed. Most people wouldn't recognize it. Same thing with arugula. Arugula stands a little bit taller, but uh, if it's in an overgrown area, it's it's going to blend in, and that that's how you plant. You want to plant natural. You know, no rows or anything like that. You want to keep it as natural as you can, and then make sure that you put a lot of debris and material around so nobody can see where the soil has been cleared away. Um, borage is definitely uh, a, a good pick for this. Like I said, it, it doesn't look edible, doesn't feel edible, and even if you don't like it, your uh, chickens will love it. Sesame gets very tall, looks like a tall weed. Uh, chia, otherwise known as salba, packed with nutrients. It's super expensive in the health food stores, looks like a weed, very large. You see the ch -ch -ch chia pets and it looks like it would be a small plant, but when that is planted outdoors, it gets enormous. I had it towering over me. Uh, I'm five foot five, and this plant was, you know, easily six, six and a half in good conditions. Flax and uh, tobacco. Also, I would try the Florence fennel. Uh, some of the varieties of kale, uh, I don't think most people would recognize unless they're, you know, had been gardening for quite some time if you put it in, you know, and sporadically. Uh, the sweet potato vines and potato vines, definitely, the sweet potato looks more like an ornamental, uh, a shorter vining plant. Uh, beautiful dark green leaves, but, you know, since it's underground, you don't really see anything that's edible. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is the sesame, salba, and uh, flax. The chickens just absolutely love this and, and, you know, coming into feed, if they're on a limited diet, the egg production drops way back because they, animals, that's just how nature works. If they're not uh, fed well, don't have a steady supply, they will uh, stop producing young. And um, the other thing that I had wanted to mention, oh, bush beans, and I'd maybe try some spinach. Uh, herbs, with the exception of basil, I'd go for the perennial. They uh, tend to be a little bit more hardy and, you know, easily, easily overlooked. Uh, the other thing is get into, like, uh, the army survivalist type of thing and learn how to test wild plants. The Italians are very fond of dandelion and in the early spring it was a big family tradition to go out 
and we'd have our little paring knives and, and baskets or paper bags and we'd go up to the pastures and just cut the dandelion out right where it meets the roots so they're nice little clusters. It takes a lot of water to wash them but they are packed with nutrients and it the flower buds uh, my sister and I used to fight over them. They are, for us, they were very delicious with a little bit of onions and Italian dressing. And, you know, of course, people make dandelion wine. But that's one of these things that people are going to overlook is the bounty that's already been provided. In my area, we have wild blackberries and wild grapes and even these tiny little wild strawberries. So. The uh, idea behind eating wild is you better know what you're doing. And in the survivalist uh, instructions, they say to separate your plant, if you're not quite sure whether you could eat it or not, into three sections, root, stem, leaves. And your first test is a skin test. And I always start right here by my elbow, so we go roots, stem, and leaves, how it would correspond to its growth on the plant, that way you never get mixed up. And you break the plant open and you rub it on your skin, and if there's no reaction half hour, usually you'll feel a reaction way before then, but I would go even longer than what the survivalists recommend. No reaction, then your next test is uh, your mouth test and this is you just chew it and spit it out and I believe they recommend waiting 24 hours to even see could be shorter than that so you do the homework on that one and you check to see if there's a reaction in your mouth no reaction then prepare it how you if you want to eat it raw just eat it raw very small amount or cook it and then you have to wait for quite some time and see if there's a reaction be very, very careful with that, like you know, people say with the mushrooms as well. There are also varieties of green tomatoes that they never change color. And there are varieties of bell peppers that don't go to, you know, orange or red. They will they will hold their green color, and this will be great for camouflage in a pirate gardening situation. And of course. Uh, the medicinal wildflowers. That's one of the things that uh, I played with it all the time was plantain when I was a kid. It has uh, dark green rounded leaves and then it shoots this little poker up with a whole bunch of seeds all over it. And we just used to like to pull the seeds off of that. Well that's medicinal. So is jarro and bachelor buttons and tons of other. Uh, I would try a white ribbed chard in a pirate garden uh, not the red ribbed red that just sticks out like, you know, like a flag. Also the New Zealand spinach. Um, I think I'm going to get into the chickens. All right. Chickens absolutely love bugs of all kinds. And uh, it high in protein, of course. So damp wood and even the old bushel baskets, if they're a little bit damp or just in a cooler, dark place, they will uh, attract cockroaches and, and damp cardboard. And my girls got so used to this, you know, I'd give them a little whistle and I'd start moving that stuff around and those chickens are lightning fast and the bugs would start to, ro roaches would start to take off as you lift the wood up. And I had even... Um, I thought about it, I didn't get to it, was building a shallow box with a piece of plywood or something of the sorts on a hinge and that way it would be really easy to uh, put back down, dampen it, get more roaches in there and then every couple days lift it up for your cockroaches, free protein. And also I had noticed a couple of times that my I was keeping the mixed grains in the white buckets and uh, my boy didn't snap the lid down and where it had been situated in the shed a driving rain came in and it actually got moist and within a couple days there were all kind of maggots in there 
Now some people will tell you, don't feed your chickens spoiled food. Well, I had put out fresh water on a regular basis. They had a little watering system plus buckets all over the place. And for whatever reason, the chickens wanted to drink from the compost tea bins. And they didn't have a problem with eating uh, what I would have considered rancid. They would go into the back area of the garden where I was just composting in a heap and, and dig through there, eat some of the vegetable scraps, plus they were digging for the bugs. So I'm not quite sure. The birds were all, they were just extremely healthy and very prolific egg producers. The eggs were as golden as I had ever seen and they actually, I tell people we needed a jackhammer to get into them because they ate a lot of our greens and high in calcium and so the eggshells were nothing like the store-bought eggs where they break easily. These things I was slamming them on the countertop to get into them. They absolutely love borage strawberries and sesame amaranth. They love the beet tops and they'll eat the beet tops down and then the beets will sprout again. So you could actually even have a separate garden for them and I had a couple different areas that I would rotate to let the plants recuperate and they would be foraging someplace else or going into a garden place someplace else and I would have them on rotation. They love all of the cabbages Swiss chard, they'll eat it down, and if uh, if you let the Swiss chard root in there, it will sprout back. They love spinach, uh, but usually once they get in there, with uh, they they scratch a lot. So with the smaller rooted plants, they usually destroy the bed and it won't grow back. But that's the plus to the beets, and the Swiss chard is that it's a heavier root, and many of those plants will survive this onslaught. They will absolutely destroy squash, melon, corn, and the greens, the shallow rooted greens. They didn't bother any type of herb, potatoes, peas, beans, peppers, until they, they touched the peppers later in the season, as well as tomatoes. They didn't bother them when they had lots of other stuff going on, but once the greens production started to wane, they went after after those, but never hot peppers and did minimal damage on the bells. Um, so the other thing that I had learned to minimize my labor, so along fence lines I had planted uh, the sesame and amaranth and that way when it came in all I needed to do was go every you know every day or so and shake the plants and seeds would fall and it, the same you know that some of them will be self-sowing and, and sprout back a couple plants for you the following season but that way I didn't have to schlep the feed from one place to the chicken so all along their coop their fence line different things had been planted for them they never bothered any of my uh, wild flowers either um, so, I oh trimming their their wings. We had done this, but they had been escape artists anyway, and they found that Eve, they could take a couple steps up on the fence and then propel themselves over. It was a four foot fence or so, and they couldn't get straight from the ground up. But these smart little birds figured all they needed to do was just climb up a little bit and then they would be able to get over. They just needed to boost themselves by a foot or two. And they really didn't, uh, we were on uh, a little over an acre and then we had some farmland around us and, and the neighbor's property was about an acre and vacant. But they really stayed very close to home and uh, we weren't on, you know, a main route or anything. So. Uh, they do need to be dewormed every once in a while. And also, if you're going to make biddies, babies, uh, do this in the summer months because if we run into an energy, you know, electrical grid problem, uh, they need a uh, heat source when they're first born. I'm going to say this off the top of my head. I believe they need to be kept at around 98. So if you get into the chickens, 
have a thermometer and some heat lights uh, for when we don't have an electrical problem and if we do make sure you let the biddies hatch in the summer months otherwise you're going to be walking around breathing on them trying to keep them warm all right i'm going to be back with some tips on dental health and and medicinals and exercises for developing the imagination um, as always much appreciate it welcome new subscribers and uh, and blessings and peace to all of you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.